Chapter 15 The rest of the day, Daniel was like a man possessed. The conference room of the National Hurricane Centre was turned into his command centre. All around the table were computers, radios and files, and there, situated right in the middle of everything, the nexus of it all, was his simple little laptop. Cables ran everywhere, connecting the various components together. Aja, a young Navy ensign assigned to be his liaison, stood off to one side and worked a radio. It was hard to believe that she was an officer in the US Navy. Tall and with a firm build, she looked as if she'd be more at home on a basketball court. Lowering the headset from her right ear, she turned to face him. I have confirmation of all of the Sub-Zero subs, sir. The last ones will be in position within the hour. Orders? Daniel grinned. I do wish you'd stop calling me sir. It sounds so formal and makes me feel so old. Sorry, sir. Force of habit. Well, we'll see about a change of habit. For now, have the crew coordinate with Kelly. She's got the satellite tracking online. Daniel turned to Kelly, who was seated on the other side of the table. Kelly, you ready to go? She nodded. All set. The first of the subs is right on course now. Mr Fenton stood before the huge flat-screen TV that hung on the wall. It was tuned to CNN, and the news was not good. Word of the killer storm and its projected course was all over the media and the internet. Widespread riots and looting were taking place all across Florida, and martial law had been declared. Troops were trying to organise an orderly evacuation, but it was not going well at all. Out in the Atlantic, cruise ships, fishing trawlers, cargo vessels and all manner of ships were being torn apart, have sunk or have fled before the enormous wind and waves of finale. The storm was now 250 miles across, and its leading bands were starting to make landfall across Florida's east coast. What are our chances? Fenton said. Daniel scanned his laptop. If we hold to our schedule, the subs will be able to intercept the eye of Florida well to the east of the coast, about 110 miles away, as to the system's ability to lessen its strength, I can't promise anything. I wish the general hadn't disappeared on us. We could use his input, Fenton said. Kelly snorted. His input would have mounted to telling us to give up. Forget him. Oh, now what? She said, hearing her phone ring again. Whipping it out, she checked the display and pressed ignore. It's nothing. Just Dad calling again. Are they still waiting for you to come back home? Daniel said. Yes, to prepare for the end of times, she said. As if at this point I get there. Something on the TV caught Daniel's attention, out of the corner of his eye. He turned and saw a new report coming in. Well, it would seem your parents aren't alone in their belief. Check it out, he said, pointing at the screen. They all turned to watch. A number of religious groups were proclaiming the storm to be a sign that the world was entering the end of times and that Armageddon was at hand. That was followed by another team of reporters talking about the Mayan prophecy that this year, 2012, was also to be the end of times. They were debating as to whether this fit with Christian doctrine about the end of the world or was it the birth of a new era. It is said, if humanity wants to save itself from the total destruction of the biosphere, we must return to living in a natural time, the reporter said. According to this Mayan prophecy, a grand evolutionary cycle will occur this year. Is this storm the start of this? My man, Kelly said slowly. Can things get any worse? Forget about the storm causing devastation, all these loony theories and crackpot ideas being plastered across the TV and internet are going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. We're going to destroy ourselves before the eye even makes landfall. There followed yet another dismal report on conditions across Florida. The National Guard was trying to get people away from the coast, but with limited success. Virtually every road leading out of the state was jammed multiple mile long parking lots hardware stores grocery stores and gas stations were being sucked dry if things weren't bought they were stolen as the looting got worse a representative for fema came on to talk about efforts being made to get the elderly to shelters and their preparations for the aftermath the sad thing was in the background was downtown miami and it was descending into total chaos it's a pity people can't hear about what we're doing here aja said maybe a bit of good news would give them hope Kelly and Mr Fenton spun to face each other, the same wry smile playing across their faces. Daniel, totally clueless as to what was on their minds, looked at them, from one face to the other. What? What are you guys thinking about? Why the silly smiles? Within the hour, Daniel found out what they were thinking. There he was, standing in the conference room with some very bright lights shining in his face, a dozen reporters surrounding him, and all manner of microphones being shoved in his face. No sooner had he explained the Sub-Zero program than the questions started, and he was hard-pressed to answer them. Kelly finally came to the rescue. OK, people, let's leave our resident genius here to do his job. If you'll all just step over here, I'll do my best to answer your questions. Daniel smiled and gave her a thumbs up, even as he cringed to see the latest calculations on Finale. Mr Fenton stepped closer to him and whispered, 
What's wrong? Daniel pointed at the screen of his laptop. Look at the projected storm surge for Finale. Oh my, Mr. Fenton said, gasping in obvious shock. That's higher than most of Florida. Most of central Florida will be completely inundated. It would appear that we have yet another reason to pray for success, Daniel whispered. He looked over at Kelly, still happily chatting away with the press, and painted a smile on his face. Several miles away, in one of the best hotels in Miami, General Stefano Lowe stood at the end of his king-size bed and watched the TV. He was not a happy man. Crocious, on the phone with Stefano, was also not a happy man. On the screen was that squealing little shrew, Kelly Delany, and she was destroying them. "'You're seeing this, are you, General?' Crocious said softly. "'Yes, sir. Oh, what a vile, vile woman. And are you seeing the stock market reaction scrolling along the bottom of the screen?' Stefano nodded, despite there being no way for Crocious to see him. Yes, sir. U.S. oil stocks went up instead of down four points before the market closed following the news. Yes, up. Which is what we want, General. Do you have any idea of how much even one point will cost us? Crocious said. No, I'm no accountant, but I'm willing to bet it will be a substantial sum. Ah, always with the jokes, General. Yes, a substantial sum indeed. We're talking millions and millions of dollars. Even for men of means, as we are, it would add up to a lot. In addition, if the system should work, our losses could be massive. That's a very big if, sir, Stefano said. We're talking... About our money, Crocious snapped. Stefano gave a little jump. Crocious could be firm when he wanted to be. And what do you want me to do about it? Stop these subs from completing their mission. I don't care how you do it, but just do it. That's a tall order, sir, Stefano replied. You're a general. You're well paid. What's that expression? That's why you get the big money. Well, start earning it. Stefano swallowed hard. I'll get right on it, sir. I expect nothing less. Click. The line went dead. Stefano hoped that was symbolic of his own fate. Never mind. The question at hand was how to deal with this situation. He couldn't sink the subs, that was too extreme, besides no surface ship or plane could get into position to take a shot at them. Ah, communications. If he could cut the head off the chicken, that'd do the job. Now actually killing Daniel wasn't a viable option, he'd get caught, and there wasn't time to hire an assassin, so forget that idea. No, merely damaging the satellite uplink on top of the building would be enough. So he needed some tools, and then he needed to get over to the office. With that, General Lowe set to work. He had to wait until dark, and then he ordered his driver to take him to the alley that ran behind the National Hurricane Centre. Storm clouds were gathering, the wind had picked up, and a light rain was starting to fall. Stefano hopped out of the back seat and moved up to the driver's window. OK, driver, go into the parking garage and wait for me. I should be back in under an hour. The lady nodded. Yes, sir. With that, she drove off. As for the general, he'd come prepared. He had his night vision goggles, a rain poncho, and his tools so he made his way to the side of the building. Above him was the metal fire escape. Playing out the short line and grapple he had, he swung it around and around and let it fly. The metal clang told him he'd found his mark. A firm tug and the ladder was down within reach. Stefano looked around, no sign of anyone in the area. With that, he started climbing. Yeah, it'd been a while since he'd run the obstacle course, so he was a bit winded by the time he reached the roof. Still, he made it. The wind began to pick up, and a flash of lightning was followed by a distant rumble of thunder. Stefano flinched and blinked his eyes. Bright light and night vision goggles were not a good mix. Moving about the roof, he made his way through a vertebral forest of poles, towers and satellite dishes. Pulling out a piece of paper, he consulted the sketch he'd made of the central communication system. Yes, the main satellite dish was up on the centre tower. He moved to the tower even as another blast of lightning arced across the sky. He pulled out his wire cutters and began to study all of the myriad of cables running up and down the tower. Good grief, it was like a great jungle of black vines. And which one should he cut? Stefano pulled out another sheet of paper he had. This was the electrical schematic for the roof systems. Boom, a roll of thunder echoed across the sky. Stefano, ever the good soldier, barely flinched. Ah, here it is, he said to no one in particular. Cut this and Daniel is off the air. Reaching up with the clippers... He put his left hand on the tower to steady himself and encircled the slim cable with the blades of the clipper, and he froze. Lights and power and the dance of a thousand sparklers surrounded him. What was going on? Was he on fire? A huge boom seemed to envelope his entire existence as his eyes rolled back into his head and every muscle of his body took on a life of its own. His left hand was gripping the tower so hard he thought, sure he was going to crush the metal with his bare hand. 
and then came darkness. The light show ended and Stefano collapsed to the roof. His brain seemed alive with all manner of thoughts and ideas. It was as if he were in overdrive from drinking a dozen espressos. The roof of the building felt cold and wet, and yet it seemed to be changing. Or was it his body that was changing? The sensation of cold evaporated, and soon he felt nothing, as if he were floating on a cloud. Then the darkness completely embraced him. In the conference room, Daniel watched the large dual screens before him. On the left was the news report on the storm, which was all very bad. On the right was a satellite uplink giving them a real-time display of the storm and the sub-zero subs. The GPS tracking on the subs showed them to be closing in on the eye. He and everyone else jumped as a huge blast of thunder practically made the building shudder, and the lights dimmed for a moment. Fortunately, all the important equipment were on generators. Right now they were just getting a mild thunderstorm, but they were planning for the worst. Daniel slowly nodded. Yeah, they're nearly there. Aja, are we still online with all the subs? Yes, sir, she replied, practically shouting. Clearly she was getting excited. When do they activate the system? Daniel pointed at the screen. When that last one is in position. Kelly just about glowed. She was clearly so very happy. Daniel, you were born to command, she said and then turned to one of the staff. Check the breakers and make sure that last lightning bolt didn't mess anything up. The man nodded and took off. A phone rang, and Daniel recognised it as his cell. Picking through his stuff on the table, he pulled it out, read the display, and put it to his ear. "'Hey, Gabby, what's up? Daniel, where are you? Are you still in Miami?' she said. From the background noises, it was clear she was in the vehicle of some sort. "'Yeah, I'm at the Hurricane Centre. Why, what's wrong, Gabby? You sound upset. It's Pop, Daniel. He's gone out on his boat.' "'What?' he replied, practically screaming. Kelly moved closer to him. "'Daniel, what's wrong?' Daniel held up his hand to gesture for her to wait a moment while Gabby spoke. He decided to go sailing, she said. I tried to call him about the storm, but he's got his phone off. Heck, knowing him, I bet the battery is dead. Are you sure he's gone sailing? Do you know where he's gone? Daniel said. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I just left the marina and I've headed down I-95. South is the only direction moving. North is wall-to-wall cars. That's perfect. Keep coming all the way to Miami and we'll link up. Wait, why'd you come this way? Were you coming to see me? No, I wasn't sure if you were still in Miami, Gabby said. I stopped in to see Phil and Pat to ask them for help. They blew me off. Daniel rolled his eyes. Those two are beyond belief. Don't give a care about Pop, only his money. Well, come on down here and we'll see about doing something to find him. Okay, big bro, and thanks. With that, Daniel hung up and turned to face the others. It was clear from their expressions that they knew something was wrong. Daniel, what's wrong? Kelly said. He gave her and the others a rundown on what was up. Aja moved to her computer and punched up some information on the screen. Ah, here's that marina, Aja said. Oh my, do you have any idea where he was headed? Daniel shook his head. No, but knowing Pop it was probably east, so that means he's in trouble. Ah, not necessarily, sir, she replied. Ah, the storm may shift north or south. Daniel, do you want to leave? Kelly said, her voice soft and gentle. He hung his head. No, what would be the point? There's no one... There's no way I could hope to find him out there. Besides, I have a duty to perform here. Aja stepped up next to Daniel and practically snapped to attention. Mr Mayhew, if anyone is deserving of the title as sir, it's you. Leave it to me. I'll alert air, sea rescue and the coast guard. We'll see about getting some choppers up in the area. Thank you, he replied and then looked at the screen. The subs are in position. It's time to crank up Sub-Zero and see what it can do. With that, everyone got to their stations. The satellite imaging showed the centre of Hurricane Finale, a very tight eye and the locations of the subs as they slowly moved in a circle beneath the surface of the churning waters of the Atlantic. Daniel checked his laptop. Excellent. The subs are five miles apart in a 20-mile diameter circle and the system is online. Now they are to continue moving in a circular motion and maintain their depth at 50 feet. Is that clear? Aja nodded. As crystal, sir. Passing it on to them now. Kelly. Are the planes in position to monitor our progress? Daniel said. Kelly moved to her radio and computer. Yes, they're circling in the eye as we speak. OK, people, all we can do now is wait and maybe pray, Daniel said. With that, the room fell silent, and the people gathered around to watch and wait. Only time would tell if they were going to have any degree of success. <laughs>